KPCC's podcasts are supported by Harvey Mudd College, where engineering, science, and mathematics are informed by the liberal arts. Students and faculty working together to solve problems and serve society. Online at hmc.edu. I'm Pat Morrison. Domestic violence is responsible for an immense amount of death and suffering in this country. Once in a while, women fight back, and the question of whether or not the system treats them fairly when they do is one of the subjects dealt with in the documentary Sin by Silence, a documentary about a female inmate's support group for victims of domestic abuse and how they're coping with their sentences and with the laws that put them there. Joining me in studio to talk about this is Olivia Klaus, who is director and producer of Sin by Silence. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having us. It's going to be screening throughout Southern California throughout the summer and going on a national tour. You are going on national tour mm-hmm. with the film. Uh, also joining me is Alice LaViolette, the domestic violence counselor for survivors and perpetrators and an expert witness in the case of the woman we'll be hearing from in a moment. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Pat. And that woman is Brenda Klubine, who I met a number of years ago at a hearing in the prison where she had been sentenced after killing her partner. She is founder of the support group featured in the documentary. You have been out for eight months after serving 26 years behind bars. How are you doing? Wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. (laughs) So, Olivia Klaus, how did you, domestic violence seems to be something that is always with us. How did you decide that it is worthy of a documentary? Um, You're right, Pat. Domestic violence has always been around. It is a crisis that is not going to go away anytime soon. And I have never experienced an abusive relationship, but that doesn't mean it hasn't affected me. I got a phone call about eight years ago from a friend of mine who was asking for help. And I had no idea where to turn. It completely shattered me. And I started on this journey to find answers of why is she still with him or why does she leave and keep going back? And what are the options? What about the kids? And really, the only answers I found were in prison with this group. A colleague of mine introduced me to this group, Convicted Women Against Abuse, and they really hold the keys to the answers I was looking for because they survived the ultimate violence. And Brenda Klubine, you talk in the documentary about organizing the group, about finding it for a lot of women. It was the only way they could express themselves and feel they had any kind of of power over what was happening to them. And and to find out that you had so much in common was was an empowering experience too. Absolutely. What had happened was... Um, these women needed an opportunity to heal and have a place where they could discuss their feelings and everything they'd gone through and understand that all of that madness didn't belong to them. It, it, they didn't have to be accountable for that behavior. And it, it's been just amazing. They've grown. They've just come out of their shells. And they're healing. They're healing and they're understanding that they can make decisions for themselves. They can feel good about themselves. And they have a future to look forward to. We'll get to your personal story in a minute. But first, I'd like to ask Alice LaViolette, who was a witness in your trial. The law changed, Miss LaViolette, because for 150 years in California, self-defense was essentially about two guys in a bar brawl, each of them pulling a weapon on another. Whereas when women kill their abusers, it involves a different set of circumstances usually. How did the law change to accommodate that? Well, the law didn't change to accommodate that and, and initially. It, in fact, it wasn't until the mid-1990s that we had any kind of um, acceptability for domestic or battered women syndrome to be heard. When Brenda's case uh, was heard, pretty much better women's syndrome was looked at as more um, more prejudicial than informative. And the standard for, for self-defense was you kind of euphemistically called the reasonable man's defense. What would a reasonable man do in this situation? So there was not any, and crimes of passion, in fact, were used to mediate when men killed women in intimate relationships, but there was no mediating defense for women. It was used as an excuse. Absolutely came out of old English common law. Now, here's a moment from the documentary where one of the members of Convicted Women Against Abuse speaks out about her experience. Her name is Virgil, and she's talking about how the standards are different, as you were saying. Somebody said, if he didn't hit his friends, and he didn't hit his boss who made him angry, he made conscious decisions while he was angry that you weren't worth holding back from. And Alice LaViolette, has that been a double standard, do you think, when you go to court and you testify in some of these cases? It was a double standard. Um, It's much different now. You don't see crimes of passion used 
as a mediating defense, and battered women's syndrome is really used under the sort of the rubric of post-traumatic stress disorder. But people are willing to listen to it now, and that really has come from education and media shows like this that that help people to understand why women stay. Here's another moment from the documentary called Sin by Silence. Here, Glenda, who is also a member of Convicted Women Against Abuse, she's still in prison, and she's explaining how this battered woman's syndrome was not admissible in court. There were no laws at that time to make domestic violence, battered woman syndrome, admissible. The judge allowed it, but they made a sham of it. They told the jury, this is not a legal defense. We're only allowing her to tell what took place. Brenda Klubine, tell us your story about how you killed your husband and how some of the limitations on what you could bring in at the time and what you, you couldn't, what, what part of your story you couldn't tell. Well, essentially, um, unfortunately, in one night, my life changed for 26 years. And I needed to protect myself. And uh, the district attorney would not allow me to testify about specific incidents of abuse between my husband and I. And initially, the judge had agreed to allow me an expert witness. And then just prior to the defense putting on their case, it was denied because there had been no precedent set. And because of the jury only heard bits and very small pieces, they weren't able to understand, again, why a woman stays, how this affects her, how walking on eggshells all the time makes things different. And that whole reasonable man syndrome doesn't fit into a battered woman situation. And then you were in prison when you wrote to Governor Wilson and said, hey, this is a different deal from what the law allows at this point. What was his response, and how did you get members of the state legislature to come hear your stories? Well, basically, what had happened was um, I had sent a booklet out to every governor and every legislator and every senator, not just in the state of California, but in all the states. And I got a letter from, uh, at that time, Jackie Spear, who was the head of the California Women's Legislative Caucus. Now a member of Congress. Yes. And she and John Burton, et cetera, a whole bunch of them came down to um, CIW. We held a public hearing on domestic violence. That's 12, the California Institute for yes. Women. And um, the, there were 12 people, 12 women from CWAA testified, and they testified about the type of abuse they suffered from, the nightmare, the silence, what it cost. And... Ultimately, from that public hearing on January the 2nd of the following year of 1992, 1107 of the, of the evidence code came into effect that then afforded the battered woman syndrome to be admissible and used as evidence in a court of law. And has that now ta been taken up by other states as well? Um, there are a few, actually, that it has been taken up, and it's, it's spreading. It's spreading. Hopefully, how, like, fire soon. Well, how, <laughs> Brenda Klubine, how has it changed what has happened in court? Have women been acquitted because of this? Have their sentences been altered because of this? The type of charge, normally you're charged immediately with first-degree murder. People are, women are being charged with manslaughter, and they're being acquitted. If they're going on trial, many women are being acquitted. So there's a lot, they're looking at things a lot different now, and they're paying attention to the subtlety of what happened and and how things happened and what all the circumstances were, and they, they are no longer just picking and choosing what they allow. We're talking about the new documentary, Sin by Silence, with the director and producer of it, Olivia Kaus, with Alice LaViolette, who's an expert witness and a domestic violence counselor, and with Blen Brenda Klubine, who's in the documentary, is the founder of the support group, who is now out of prison after eight months, or for eight months after serving 26 years behind bars for the killing of her husband. Um, Olivia Klaus, uh, when I talked uh, about this to the head of the California District Attorneys Association in 1990, he said that changing the law to allow this kind of testimony amounted to a recipe for murder. Have you seen how the nature of prosecutions has changed? Was he right that this has opened the floodgates to the murder of men by the women who they have abused? 
I don't think it's necessarily open the floodgates. This is not a license to kill. That is not this battle. This is that is not this movement. What this movement is about and what these women are about in Convicted Women Against Abuse is just really understanding why they did what they did, why they felt the need to defend themselves. They did not mean to kill him. They did not mean all they were doing was defending themselves. What happened in these situations, there was so much violence and so much abuse and so much that was going on that you just have to protect yourself at some point. And that is all of these women in convicted women against abuse are not saying what they did was right, but they are asking for why are we still here? And that's what was happening with in 1991, 1992 with the whole battered women's syndrome is, hey, what about us? Really understand where we're coming from. Alice LaViolette? It was re- really interesting to me um, that that opened up on A&E and American Justice. They said, is that going to open the door for women killing men? We don't see increases in women killing men at all. But what's interesting is crimes of passion were never seen as an excuse and a, and a way for men to get away with murder. And that's been true since we were our legal system was organized. So there is very definitely a, a double standard. There's been gender studies in the court that criminal uh, criminal justice process, even evidentiary law, is prejudiced against women because it asks for discrete incidences, and women tend to talk more in context. So there are a lot of little subtleties of the law, and I think as juries understand this, and when someone explains it, juries are very open to hearing it. Not to say, okay, you, you're off, unless it happened right at the moment, but but to say this at least explains something and you're not a, you're not a threat to society. Yeah. We'd like to hear from you as we talk about the documentary Sin by Silence about domestic violence, 866-893-5722. Maybe you'd like to share some stories with us. Maybe you are a victim of domestic violence. Maybe you're someone who's taken part in a court process as a juror or an attorney in a domestic violence case. We'd like to hear from you at 866-893-KPCC. You can also let us know on the Pat Morrison blog at kpcc.org your thoughts and your ideas about this. Maybe you have questions for Brenda Klubein or for Olivia Klaus, the director and producer of Sin by Silence, or for Alice LaViolette, the domestic violence counselor for both survivors and perpetrators. Call and let us know at 866-893-KPCC or on the Pat Morrison blog. Olivia Klaus, we mentioned this is going to be shown throughout the Southland this summer. Um, Where is it going to be screening and when that people can see? Um, You can go to our website at sinbysilence.com. We have a lot of stuff here locally that we're planning with various organizations and universities. And then this fall, we will be going on tour. So people um, will be able to ask questions afterwards of all of you about... When we're on tour, Brenda and I will be touring, and we will be showing the film, and Brenda will get up to hold a discussion afterwards. And so definitely the way to keep on track is through our website at sinbysilence.com. When we come back, we're going to be hearing more from Brenda Klubein about the questions this documentary raises, the kinds of questions she has been hearing as she's out and talking about it with uh, victims of domestic violence, even perpetrators of domestic violence, and people in the law enforcement system who've dealt with it. More from all three of my guests when we come back in a moment at 89.3 KPCC. This is 89.3 KPCC online at kpcc.org. Good afternoon. I'm Hetty Lynn Hurdies. California will step up its campaign against bad diets, bulging waistlines, and clogged arteries when three new laws dealing with restaurant and school food take effect July 1st. The Golden State will become the first in the nation to require restaurants to disclose how many calories are in their standard menu items. It will also bar schools from offering students fries, baked goods, and other dishes made with oil oils, margarine, or shortening containing trans fats, and it'll prevent high schools from selling soda to kids. Michael Jackson's mother will serve as temporary guardian of the singer's three children. A judge this morning granted Katherine Jackson's request to become temporary guardian of her grandchildren. Jackson's father, Joe, says he's pleased by the decision. Of course, this is where it belongs. We're the parents, and we've got other kids of their size. They love those kids, and we love those kids, too. We're going to take care of them and give them the education they, they're supposed to have. We can do that. The judge set a later hearing to determine who will be the children's permanent guardian. The judge also ordered that the court offer notice of the hearing to Deborah Rowe, the mother of the two older children. Jackson's youngest child was born to a surrogate mother whose identity is unknown. Catherine Jackson also has asked to be named the administrator of her late son's estate. The judge set a hearing two weeks from today to address that issue. 
Direct flights from L.A. to Havana will resume tomorrow, two months after President Obama decided to ease travel restrictions to Cuba. Cuba Travel Services will offer a flight every Tuesday via Continental Airlines. The jet will take off from LAX at 11 in the morning. Most travel from the U.S. to Cuba has been banned since an embargo was imposed in 1962, but Cuban Americans have been allowed to visit under various policies since then. It's 221 at 89.3 KPCC. I'm Pat Morrison. Domestic violence is omnipresent in our society, so much so that the sin of silence, as it is called, the name of the documentary about domestic violence in an inmate support group, the invisibility of domestic violence has been one of the factors that has allowed it to go on for a very long time. A number of police departments, including uh, at the head of the pack, the LAPD, have changed some of their policies about domestic violence. They used to treat these calls as a bit of a nuisance, and officers have told me that they would go out and affect what they called an LAPD. APD divorce between the uh, man and the woman, just saying essentially, put your hand on the badge, you're divorced overnight, go back and come back the next day and make up. But now it is a much more seriously crafted, a much more seriously uh, considered crime by police across the country, in no small part because of some of the changes in the laws that allow for battered women's defense to come into court when that plays into the issue. My guests are Olivia Klaus, who is director and producer of Sin by Silence, the documentary that I mentioned. Alice LaViolette is a domestic violence counselor for survivors and perpetrators. And Brenda Klubine has been out of prison for eight months after serving 26 years for killing her husband. We're taking your calls and questions at 866 866- 893 KPCC. Renee is calling from West Los Angeles. Renee, thanks for your call. Hi. Uh, I was a prosecutor earlier in my career, and I did prosecute domestic violence cases. And what I found was that the police were rather insensitive to the victims and intimidated them in a way that they were reluctant to testify. I do understand that that's improved now and that that there are women uh, police officers interviewing women victims. But I also think that the prosecutors are, were too eager to um, allow cases to go, in other words, to, to uh, plea bargain them out in domestic violence cases because the victims were often reluctant to testify and the officer's testimony was usually after the fact of what they observed and that was open to cross-examination and, and uh, impeachment. Renee, thank you for that. Uh, Brenda Klubine, you're nodding your head. Wow. (laughs) I can relate to all of that. I can relate to not being able to express to the police what really happened because they didn't want to hear it, because they allowed the abuser to take control of the situation with the police officers. So um, I appreciate your your being able to come forward with that and, and also understand that plight. And uh, Alice LaViolette, has that changed the way that police departments now handle domestic violence calls domestic and prosecutors handle domestic violence cases? Well, there was a change in the law in 1984 in regard to uh, mandatory arrest in California. The policy sort of changed to a pro-arrest policy. The law hasn't changed. But police officers were, for a period of time, getting a lot of training on domestic violence, and they were getting training from outside of the force. So they would bring community people in. Over time, what happened is I think it's more in-house training, and I don't think they're getting the same kinds of training with, you know, budgetary cutbacks or whatever. Uh, But definitely it's changed. I mean, you see police cars that have the bumper sticker, there's no excuse for domestic violence. And when I started in the 1970s. You didn't see anything like that. Let's hear from Jennifer, who is in Irvine. Jennifer, thank you for your call. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is for Ms. LaViolette or anyone who can answer it, actually. I, I have a judge on a case where um, a prior male judge gave me a permanent restraining order. The new female judge, she's actually in San Diego, um, said she removed the restraining order and wanted us to start co-parenting were, was her reason. And I have since come into her courtroom with written emails from my ex-husband telling me I'm not going to live to see the end of this divorce, and she refuses to give me a restraining order. And I don't know what to do. Uh, my current attorney says we don't want to upset the apple cart and ask for a new judge and just try and 
get the best result we can without that. But I am afraid for myself, and I have a four and a six year old. Jennifer, I'm stay. Very afraid. Jennifer, stay on the line, okay, and don't go away. Let's hear first from Alice Laviolette. Um, Jennifer, one of the things I would do is connect with a local shelter and ask for a court advocate. You need a victim advocate to work with you, and you probably need an agency behind you. Uh, That would be helpful. So I would get on the line with the shelter and do it during normal working hours because that's when the full staff is usually there. Um, The other thing is uh, you could get an expert witness uh, that's expensive, uh, You can usually get some advice uh, from an expert, maybe over the phone, but it would be really helpful for you to have an agency behind you and and court watch. There are groups of people that sometimes go to court, observe what a judge is doing, and then uh, make reports on that. So So Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, don't go away. Brenda Klubon, you wanted to say something to Jennifer, too. Wow. Jennifer, my heart goes out to you first and foremost. Secondly... All I can say, girl, is hang in there. You have to do whatever you can to remove that judge from your case. You cannot allow this woman, this female judge, to stand up and take away your restraining order, which protects you and your children for as much as it can. Um, Get the media involved. And Jennifer, stay along, stay on the line. We'll see if we can get you in touch with somebody who can give you some more advice. Uh, Olivia Klaus, so often, and you mentioned this in your documentary, Sin by Silence, people just say, well, just get out. Why can't you just get out? Right. It's that I used to think that way too. And it's from getting to know these women and convicted women against abuse, I realized how hard that is. There's so many different dynamics. There is financial dynamics. There is they are dependent on these men. There are children involved. There are families. There are there's religious stigma. There's cultural stigma. There are so many different dynamics, and this is not a black and white issue. This is definitely a gray area with so many different layers that can just peel away to just this violence that is all encompassing. And I wish it was so easy that she could just leave, but it's it's really not. We'd like. We'd like to hear from you as we talk about Sin by Silence, Silence, a documentary about domestic abuse. 866-893-5722 is the number. You can let us know your thoughts on the Pat Morrison blog or call us with your questions and concerns at 866-893-KPCC. Alice LaViolette, so you work with survivors and perpetrators. I suppose the question is when you bring the abuser into the equation, too, how does that change things? Well. Uh- well, we, we separate them. The, the, I work with abusers groups, which is kind of the law in the state of California. You have to have same-gendered groups. And um, my group grew out of my work at the shelter. We actually, because we were seeing about 80% of the women who came to our shelter at a very, you know, very short period of time, that we saw that they were going back to their partners, we wanted to work with their partners. And so we started a program at Women's Shelter in Long Beach. And I started that program because I couldn't find another job at the shelter. I actually didn't want to do it at first. But um, I like, I, I think it's first line advocacy for battered women is to work with perpetrators because you're trying to change the behavior of the people that have the women fleeing. And, you know, I've, I've been doing that for 30 years and probably. I wouldn't keep doing it if I didn't feel like it had an impact. 866-893-5722. As we talk about domestic abuse, let's go to West Los Angeles because Melody is on the line there. Melody, thank you. Hi. Um, hello? Yes, you're on the air. Yeah, um, I have a situation where um, my the father of my children, um, I left him due to domestic violence. and there was um, I did press charges. And he was on probation and did the, um, the anger management classes and all that. But um, as soon as his probation was up, he abducted my children. And um, I'm having a really hard time getting them back. And he's saying that um, um, basically that um, everybody's telling me that it's the statute of limitations or whatever has run out and, um, you know, too much time is since the charges um, were pressed against him. And uh, what, what, what are the laws as far as custody goes? Uh, well, do you have a custody order, and how is um, that? Well, we're, I have a hearing, actually, tomorrow morning. 
Did, um, were you yeah. given Were you given fu- um, full custody of your children when you when you divorced? Were you so, given well, we, le- sole we legal? Never, we were never married. Okay. And he's not the biological father of my children, but uh, I mean of my daughter, but my son he is. And he and, took both the children. Yes, he did. And um, the the judge is telling me that. Um, he's being um, allowed pre- to be presumed father because he signed my daughter's birth certificate. But well, well, the the law in California, or the or the disposition of the court in California, is for shared parenting, which means that at the very least you should have your children half the time, and then uh, you can go for more than that. But once again, you need you probably need an attorney and a victim advocate. You're in West LA. Yes, I am. I would contact Sojourn Shelter, uh, S- Sojourn Sh- uh, Services for Battered Women. They have victim advocates, court advocates there. They have a women's group for support. And uh, they may have, and I'm not sure if they have any pro bono attorneys, but they might have recommendations for attorneys. What was the name of the place? It's Sojourn Services for Battered Women. If you if you call uh, 411 and ask for... Um, uh, the domestic violence hotline. If you ask for Sojourn, they'll give you the number. Okay, Sojourn. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. And uh, Brenda Klubine, who organized Convicted Women Against Abuse when you were behind bars for killing your husband, you're, you, all these stories you're shaking, you're nodding your head, they're resonating for you. Well, yeah. Um, you know, that's something that I just hasn't changed. They're still giving abusers the children. What is wrong with our society that they keep allowing this? That's why sin by silence is so important. That's why it matters so much. People need to see this, and they will be changed forever. Judges need to see this. Prosecutors need to see this. People that are in positions that make these authoritative decisions that don't have a clue what the cost is, they're ruining those children forever. Let's hear from Brad, who's calling from Burbank. Brad, thank you for your call. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. Uh, for the last uh, six years, we have a program called Be Good to Women Day, which was spawned out of a radio program that I used to have, a uh, nationally syndicated radio program for about 22 years or so called On the Phone with Tyrone. And routinely, women would call up for advice, and there was a lot of comedy involved in it and all that stuff. And I would simply say, well, if the man is beating you, he's mistreating you, walk away, just leave. And one day a lady called and said, no, you cannot do that. Because once the woman leaves the home, she is susceptible to the element of surprise. When that woman is in the home with the battery, at least she knows what time he gets off work, what time she can expect him to be home, what time certain things take place. There's a routine involved. And once the woman leaves the home, she can be accosted at work, on the street. He can stalk her. And if you go online and and, uh, Google domestic violence uh, info, you'll find that 70% 70% of the women who leave battered homes uh, end up dead. And All right. Killed by their abuser. Brad. It's not just this, 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 uh, this thing of, oh, well, he's doing wrong. I can just walk away. You can't walk away. Brad, thank you. you. And, and, and in fact, Olivia Klaus, the director of Sin by Silence, you spend a lot of time talking about how women put themselves, as, as uh, Brad was pointing out, at greater risk in a way by leaving. Definitely. And we go into that in the film where it's, it's a term they called separation assault. And just because a woman leaves does not mean that she escapes the violence because it's actually she has a 75 percent increased risk of being hurt after she leaves. And that violence can stay for up to two years. These are delicate situations and and crazy situations that these people are dealing with. It's just not that easy. And, And some of the things that you'll see is someone who is really perpetrating abuse continues to perpetrate it through the court system in child custody cases. And those cases are terrible with with costs upwards of uh, $500,000 to try to to be able to keep your children. Uh, there's a call from Enrique in Westwood, Alice LaViolette, who says, well, don't forget men who are victims of domestic violence. What percentage of, of the incidences is this, and, and is there any recourse for, for these victims? Uh, absolutely. There's a shelter uh, that takes battered men in Antelope Valley. Uh, there are shelters that provide counseling services or uh, hotel vouchers. They are seldom accessed, uh, even on um, when you're dealing with a, an anonymous hotline. Men seldom call. Um, and the estimates are that anywhere from maybe 5 to 20 percent of victims of domestic violence are men, depending on the research you read, and anywhere from 
80 to 95 percent, particularly when you look at severe violence. The data has been misused over time, and they're looking at uh, they're actually throwing isolated acts of aggression and not looking at whether it's in a context of abuse and counting that in the numbers. So, Brenda Klubine, when you watch this documentary, Sin by Silence, you've been out of prison for eight years now. You spent 26 years there. What What did you think when you saw this? Um, I It's been eight months now. Believable, I can't believe that. But, you know, um, seeing it in person on the screen was very profound for me because this film allowed the women of convicted women against abuse to have a voice. It allows them to share and hopefully educate people on the ultimate consequences of violence and what their nightmare led them to. It led them to the point where they had to protect their life. And I I feel as though, you know, it's like a proud mother with, with her chickens, you know, that I, you know, I worked hard to start that group, and and it just, I am so amazed and so proud of all the women. Let's hear from North Hills where Marsha's on the line. Marsha, thanks for your call. Hi. um, I've been a victim of domestic violence for a better part of 18 years. I spent five years still in a divorce from this person, and I have four children, ages 7 through 14, and um, I, I have to say, I've had all types of abuse used against me, sexual, financial, m- mental, or emotional, and um, physical. And we say in my domestic violence group, I'm a member of this sojourn group in Santa Monica, um, that, um, y- you know, bones heal, but words can hang in there forever. And I was giving an example to somebody of just what's been done to my children, um, children who are very, all of them extremely gifted. We had them tested for one reason or another and very talented. And one of them built a little structure out of Legos. It took him two or three days to build. And it was, you know, we're talking a thousand mm-hmm. Legos. Dad yeah, got angry with the sun and just threw it against the wall and broke it into a million pieces. Marcia, yeah. you, you bring up a good point. Our time is running short, but I do want to ask Olivia Klaus about that, the, the things that the abuse that doesn't show. Yes. And that is the one thing that a lot of people resort to is they, they always think it's just slapping or hitting, but actually the words and the verbal and emotional abuse hurt the worst. And that is the one thing I see in these women in Sin by Silence is that they have been away from their abusers for 20 years now they've been in prison and they are still crying to this day like it was the first day. And they have been separated from that abuse and from the physical violence, but those words are still with them, and their identities are still broken from those words that happened 20 years ago. Ladies, I want to thank you for being here, and thank all of you for your calls. You can keep letting us know your thoughts at the Pat Morrison blog at kpcc.org. Olivia Klaus is director and producer of Sin by Silence, the documentary about the women's support group for victims of domestic violence. Brenda Klubine organized that group behind bars. She has been out for eight months after 26 years behind bars. They'll be showing the documentary around Southern California and holding a panel to hear from you about your questions, comments, and concerns. And Alice LaViolette is a domestic violence counselor and an expert witness at Brenda Klubine's trial. Thank you all for being here.